Hi, I'm Ironheart, and after playing over 900 hours of Held It Loose, I've created this little helpful guide to provide some essential information about the game and how it works for players. I bloody love Held It Loose. It's a brilliant World War II tactical shooter, and if you like first-person shooter games which require teamwork, good communication and coordination, you'll really enjoy this game. In this video, I'll be covering communication, different game modes, the importance of the tactical map, as well as spawn points, the resource system and why supplies are the bedrock of everything in Held It Loose. I've put timestamps in this video for each of the sections I'll be covering so you can jump ahead to the parts you're most interested in or just sit back and enjoy the whole video, maybe you'll learn a thing or two. I'll be making more in-depth guides for different aspects of the game in the future so why not subscribe to my channel to check those out. First, what is Hell at Loose? It is a squad based shooter which features massive western and eastern front maps where you can battle it out as either the American, German or Soviet forces with infantry and tank combat in epic 100 player battles. There are two game modes in which players duke it out for control of the map. Each team is made up of a commander who can call in special abilities to turn the tide of battle in favour for their team like bombing runs, supply drops and spawning tanks as well as supply trucks and transport trucks. Then you have officers, these are the squad leaders who command a group of up to 6 infantrymen which includes themselves and 5 other players who can choose between the following roles. A rifleman, there can be an unlimited number of these in any squad but there can only be one of the following per squad, assault, automatic rifleman, medic, support, machine gunner, anti-tank and engineer. Armour squads are made up of 3 man tank crews with a tank commander and 2 crewmen. Finally, each team can have two two-man recon squads which are made up of a spotter and a sniper. You can earn experience by playing the game, building structures, attacking or defending key objectives. XP is earned for each role which unlocks different loadouts with different weapons and playstyles available for each of the roles you can choose from. You can also unlock certain cosmetics which you can select either before you get into the game via the barracks or in-game when you select the role you wish to play. You also gain overall experience known as your career level. This unlocks certain cosmetics like different helmets. Now, communication in Hell at Loose is key. So before we go any further in this guide, my very first tip for anyone considering buying this game is get yourself a good microphone. That way you can communicate with your team. Believe me, this will make your experience in Hell at Loose a whole lot better. You can type to your team by pressing K, which everyone can see, or just to your squad by pressing L. However, the most effective way, as I said, is to actually talk to your team and your squad. Commanders, officers, tank commanders and spotters have access to three voice channels. They can directly talk to each other via the command chat by holding X. The commander appears as yellow while the squad leader appears red in this channel. Keith, guys, there's a tank to yourself. Command chat is useful to relay information like locations of enemy infantry, tanks and their spawn points. There's an airhead dropping right over here. Officers, tank commanders and spotters can also talk to their squads with unit chat by holding C. Squad chat appears as green. And everyone can speak to their nearby teammates in local chat by holding B, which appears as blue. Guys, in the building. Players can also use the middle mouse button to ping locations on the map for a brief moment to alert your squad about something. For example, you can ping a location and tell your squad through the squad chat that you saw enemies there, like this example. There's a guy in this bunker here. Got a grenade out. Yeah, we got him. Ooh, turn into mince meat. West, outside the, bunker. West. the aim of the game is to capture and hold territory, represented on the tactical map as sectors. Each sector will have one of three randomly selected strong points, which is the hashed out black circle as you can see on the map. One of the great things about Hell at Loose is that the location of the strong points can change each time you play on a map, creating tons of replayability as each sector and strong point has different terrain and layouts. Currently, there are two game modes in Hell at Loose, Warfare and Offensive modes. In Warfare, both sides fight to control the map by capturing the strong points in each sector. Teams win warfare by either capturing all of the territory or controlling more territory than the enemy by the end of the game, which lasts for an hour and a half. In warfare, control over sectors can change hand multiple times, so it's best understood as a kind of tug of war style battle. At the start of the game, both teams start with two friendly territories, which appear as blue. The enemy sectors are red. Both teams must then rush to the middle sector, which starts off as neutral. Once one side captures that neutral sector, then the adjacent enemy sectors come into play. 
It is important to note that the only sectors in play are the adjacent, friendly and enemy sectors. All other sectors are locked i.e. cannot be captured until the active sector next to it has been taken. In this game mode, the cap zone where players can influence who controls the sector is made up of the four squares around the strong point. Each player in these four squares counts as one towards the balance of control. To capture the strong point, you just need to have more troops in that area than the enemy. Having more soldiers in the cap zone won't make you capture it any faster, you simply just have to have a numerical advantage. However, the key thing to remember is that each player in the strong point itself, the black circle, will count as three towards the cap strength for your team. So get your bots in that black circle if you're attacking or defending a strong point, as you will literally be three times more effective there. In the offensive mode, there is no tug of war. One side simply has to defend while the other attacks. Most maps in Hell at Loose have an offensive mode for each team. For example, on one version of the Foy map, the Americans have to defend, while on another version, the Germans have to defend, and vice versa. In the offensive mode, once a sector has been lost, it cannot be recaptured. The attacking team can only win if they capture all the strong points on the map, and they have 30 minutes to do so per sector. So if they fail to capture a sector in the 30 minutes they have, the defenders will win. In the offensive mode, the cap zone works slightly differently. Being in the four squares around the strong point itself won't contribute to the cap strength. You need to be in the black circle to take or hold the sector. Every player in the, in the strong point counts as three. If an attacking team is in the process of capturing a strong point in the offensive game mode, when the 30 minute timer runs out, the game will go into something called overtime and eat it into one of the attacking team's resources known as manpower. Their manpower will continue to fall until they are all gone, in which case the defenders will win, but if the attackers capture that point, before the manpower runs out, the game will continue and the next objective becomes active, unless it is the final objective, in which case the attackers will have won the game. Like this example. Get the equal time. Okay, we're getting a strong point. Get a strong, get a strong point. You got it. Busa! 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 Got this, got this. Hold on, hold on. Woo! Nice. Since controlling territory is the primary objective of the game, it is a good idea for every Hell at Loose player to keep a keen eye on the tactical map throughout the game. It doesn't matter if you're playing as a rifleman or commander, keep checking the tactical map as this holds a lot of information you need to know about how your team is doing. A quick glance will tell you how a defence or attack is progressing and you can tell from the markers placed by the commander and squad leaders where enemy infantry and tanks might be. On your tactical map, you can see your position and the direction you're facing by the yellowish arrow. Your commander is represented by this yellow circle with three dots in it. Your squad leader is this green teardrop thing and your squad mates are green dots. The rest of your team are made up of blue dots and their squad leaders. Friendly vehicles are also blue. Tanks are oblongs. One dot inside is a light tank, two dots is a medium tank and three dots is a heavy tank. The recon tank is an oblong with a triangle and dot. Transport trucks which can carry a driver and 11 others is a rectangle with three circles in it while the supply truck, which carries 300 supplies in the form of two crates worth 150 supplies each, is a rectangle with a line across it. Empty friendly vehicles are grey. Hovering over blue vehicles on the map with your mouse shows you how many people are inside. To place a marker, as a commander or squad leader, either point to a location on the map which you can see and hold your middle mouse button which will open up a radial wheel of markers and select by moving your mouse which marker you wish to put down. Or, alternatively, open your map up and move your mouse over a location and press the right mouse button. This will open up a drop down menu of markers to choose from. In Hell at Loose, spawn points play a key role. The maps are pretty big, so not having spawn points in good locations can be the difference between victory and defeat. Nobody wants to be running across the map all the time because there are no good spawn points available. If you can build garrisons and outposts, you should be doing so. Do not ignore that responsibility. There are four types of spawn points. Outposts, garrisons, airheads, and HQs. Outposts, known as OPs for short, can be built by officers for their six-man squads or by a recon squad leader who can place them for his two-man recon squad. Tank commanders do not have access to outposts. To build an outpost, just scroll through your inventory 
to your watch and find a nice spot to place the OP. The outpost is only accessible to your squad, and your squad leader can only place one of them on the map at a time. If they put down another one, somewhere else, the original OP will disappear. If the enemy captures friendly territory and your squad's outposts are in there, they will be destroyed. OPs can also be taken out by direct hits from explosives or if the enemy gets too close to them. Only recon squads outposts are unaffected by the loss of territory. Recon squads can put their outposts anywhere which helps them operate behind enemy lines. Normal infantry squads can only place their outposts in friendly territory or the first two lines of an enemy sector. My top tip for outpost placement is if you're playing a squad leader and you can see your team is about to lose a sector you're in, hang back and avoid engaging the enemy. Once the sector is lost, you can quickly then just rebuild your outpost, which would have been lost when the territory fell to the enemy. This will enable you to start a counterattack sooner than if your squad had to run from the nearest garrison. Garrisons, also known as garries, are the most important spawn points because the whole team can spawn on them. They require 50 supplies to build in friendly territory, but 100 supplies to build in enemy sectors. They can be built by the commander, officers or spotters. Each team can have a maximum of 8 garrisons on the map at one time. So-called forward garrisons, the ones in enemy territory, can only be built in the first two lines of an enemy sector. Do not place these too close to where the enemy will be, because they will be disabled by proximity to the enemy. Build them slightly out of the way, so they remain active and enable your forces to stage flanking attacks. Be aware, all garrisons need to be at least 200 meters apart from each other, otherwise you will not be able to build them. When it comes to garrison placement, it is beneficial to have attacking garrisons near the front line or in enemy territory as well as defensive garrisons in and around your defensive strong point. If you don't have good garrison placement in either attack or defense, your team will suffer. Try to set up a perimeter of garrisons around a defensive position. This gives your team plenty of options to spawn on if one or even two are taken out by the enemy and you'll still have a fallback option. Garrisons and outposts also give off warnings on the tactical map if enemies are nearby, so placing them intelligently can help identify where the enemy are pushing from. If a garrison turns red, it means that it has been disabled due to the proximity of the enemy and is likely to be dismantled soon. If you come across an enemy garrison, they can be taken out by running up to them and dismantling or hitting them with an anti-tank rocket, tank shell or satchel charge explosion. If you're a squad leader, it is a good idea to ask one of your squad mates to play as a support player if no one has picked that role, as support players carry 50 supplies which they can drop for you to build garrisons. Building that garrison will enable your whole team to spawn at that location rather than just your squad. Here is a top tip. If you have an outpost up in enemy territory and your support player drops 50 supplies for you, you still need a, another 50 to get that garrison up. But if you ask your squad mate to switch roles, you can get that supply that you need. After your support player drops the supplies, get them to switch to another role while someone else can take the support role in their stead. The new support player can then spawn on the OP and drop the missing 50 supplies and bingo, you have enough for a forward garrison. Like this example. We could do the old supply switch here though, we can just drop a double set then they won't even know we're here. I've seen this roll now. Support, I'll drop supplies. Yeah, just spawn and drop them and then we'll get another one in. Well, I think we'll be fed here, so... Down. Carry up. Quality. Airheads are basically temporary garrisons which can be airdropped by commanders into enemy or friendly territory. The whole team can spawn on them and they are great for setting up sneaky flanking attacks on a strong point. However, be aware that airheads are highly visible when being dropped in, so it is smart not to drop them too close to an enemy objective. They will be spotted and destroyed before squads can even spawn on it, or the enemy will rush up and set up an ambush and annihilate any unlucky swords who spawn on it. My top tip is that commanders should drop airheads in areas which are a bit out of the way where the enemy is unlikely to be, so they remain undetected. It is better for the attackers using an airhead to have to run a little bit to their target rather than dropping it way too close to the strong point where the enemy will spot it from a mile away. Another top tip for airheads is to drop them along with an air supply drop. These provide 100 supplies for a forward garrison which can be built and used once the airhead disappears after a few minutes. This means the attack can continue even after the temporary airhead is gone. HQ spawns, as the name suggests, are found at your HQ, 
i.e. your team's side of the map. There are three to choose from and this is also where any vehicles will be spawned by the commander. By now, you should be able to see why communication and coordination is so important in Hell at Loose. That brings me to the next part of this guide, the importance of supplies. Supplies are required to build all structures in Hell at Loose except outposts. Your team and your squad will need to work together to deliver supplies where they are needed to build things like garrisons, which as we've already covered are key to winning in this game. That is why every infantry squad should have someone playing support. Supplies can be placed on the map by support players. They carry 50 supplies which can regenerate after a few minutes. Commanders can also airdrop supplies anywhere on the map with their supply drop ability. Or you can use supply trucks which carry 300 supplies in the form of two 150 supply crates. The good thing about supply trucks is that they can be resupplied back at your base with another 300 supplies when you simply drive them back to your HQ. Doing supply runs and dropping supplies for your team across the map generates a lot of experience for any class that does it. For example, if you're looking to grind some experience for say the assault class or medic role, spend some time being a useful supply truck driver while playing that role. You'll learn tons of experience. Another major part of Hell at Loose is the resources system. There are three types in Hell at Loose, which are used by the commander for a number of things. They are munitions, manpower and fuel. You can see how many resources your team currently has by opening up the tab and viewing the scoreboard or by looking at your map. The team's resources can be seen at the top. This is useful information to know because certain actions you may take or you may wish the commander to take will cost one of these resources. For example, spawning a tank can cost between 200 or 400 fuel depending on whether it is a medium or heavy tank. Check if there is enough fuel before you go asking your commander to create a 400 fuel tiger tank when there's nothing available. Using the artillery guns or a player built anti-tank gun will also eat up munitions. So don't be wasteful and use all your team's resources up without first taking one important step building resource generating structures. The three resources I mentioned are generated by nodes which can be built by engineers. There is a node for each type of resource, i.e. a munitions node, a fuel node and a manpower node. To build nodes, engineers first need to place a blueprint for the node on the map. Then any player with a hammer can hammer the blueprint to build that structure. Be aware that nodes can only be built in friendly territory and if your friendly territory is captured, your nodes will be destroyed. So try to build them in areas which won't see them destroyed. My top tip for building nodes is to space them out a bit. The only way to destroy nodes is to manually run up to them and dismantle them, or well, that takes a long time, or you can place a satchel charge on them to blow them up. If you space the nodes out, one satchel charge won't be able to take them all out. Another top tip relates to where to place nodes. Since nodes are lost when you lose territory, it makes sense to build them in safe areas. The safest area has to be the sector nearest to your HQ, as this will be the last to fall. Having nodes there means your team will be generating new resources until your last sector is lost. Supply trucks can't drop supplies in the sector closest to your HQ, but an engineer can drop them on the border and still be in range to build your set of nodes in the final sector, like this example. Alternatively, a commander can airdrop supplies to you in your own base to get nodes built away from the front line. Once a blueprint for a structure has been placed, it requires supplies nearby to actually build it. Press T to bring up your HUD or look at the map to see if you have supplies near you. There you have it, the basics of Hell Let Loose. I hope that was helpful. As more updates and changes are released for the game, I'll make more explainer videos and more guides. If you enjoyed this, please give it a like, drop a comment and subscribe for more. Thanks for watching.